What are the three types of men? The philosopher, the musician, and the lover. The lover, right. And would you not agree, many of you might say, aren't we all three? Let me check and find out. Yes. There. Yeah. Especially after reading those words. <laughs> this training in dialectic is to be imparted to all three types. What is it? What? What? What each thing is, its difference. Right, there it is. And what it differs from other things, its likeness, or what it resembles, and what category, right? and then place it in that category. In existence or not, agree? How many uh, non-existence there are, of course, just right, the difference between them, how many? what's good and what is not good, what is subordinate to the good, what is uh, subordinate to its opposite, of the nature of the eternal and of that which is not, with such knowledge about everything and not mere opinion. It puts an end to error in sense knowledge by establishing itself in the intelligible realm. Right. Would you agree he picks it up again? It uses his method, Plato, his method of division in order to distinguish ideas, to define each object, to separate the different kinds of being, and alternates between synthesis and analysis until it's gone through the entire domain of the intelligible and has arrived at the principle. Do not agree uh, we have the whole thing, or would you say bare bones? Or would you say it went by too fast for me to be sure? <laughs> that would be my conclusion. Option three. <laughs> huh? I'd say robust. That's why he needs five. He's argued, he said robust. He, Ingmar, so therefore he's making the claim it's there, I take it. Uh, I'd be inclined to think that in a concise form. <coughs> and he's inclined to. Ah, uh, weasel word. I mean, uh, yeah, precision <laughs> somewhere. For a first reading through, and how long it has been since I've been in this arc. Wouldn't it be nice for him to have an example <coughs> and take us through the example? It would be nice. Right. And uh, would you not agree there are a few things we'd like to know about, especially this one about the existences, how many they are, to distinguish each of them? Yeah. On top. On top. On top. On top. That's why we need five and six. All right. Take a look at this, just that first paragraph of five for a moment. Dialectic resorts to synthesis, 
combination, division, until it has arrived at perfect understanding. Because dialectic is the purest part of intelligence and wisdom. Conclusion. Therefore, since dialectic is our most valuable mental discipline, it must be directed to being and to the existence that is of most value, which is to say, as wisdom, it is concerned with being, and as intelligence, it's concerned with, with what is beyond being. Now, he goes on, and I just want to go to where he picks up the theme again on page 123, which is really the last three sentences. <laughs> In general, it knows the operations of the soul. Affirmation, denial, whether denial is of, is of affirmation or of something else. It knows identity and difference. <laughs> Thus it grasps, as immediately as sensation grasps its objects. The task of treating them in detail it leaves to those who have a taste for it. Now, one of the ways you can play the game of uh, philosopher is to ask always a rather simple question. <coughs> what is it that's being described? And is it something you do something with? Or to? If so, then does it have Steps, procedures, clear enough for you to follow. <clears throat> and if it does, is there sufficient evidence or support Does it reach its goal? Now, what's being described? Dialectic. Is it something you do with or use it for something or direct it towards something? Mm -hmm. If so, then. Does it have steps or procedures enough for one to follow or to do it? In other words, is it a map? Is it a map that you can follow? Can you use it? Or is it making claims How broad are the claims? Does it include all that is necessary to exhaust the subject? Uh, 
And in the same way, does the author in making these claims add anything which you might find curious? Right? Some curious features to it? That, and does it need additional explanations? Or is it self-sufficient? Well, that's what you want to know. So therefore you have to have you have to have some idea of the dialectic here. Some model, right, some model, so that you can then use to check off his claims against what you have found in terms of the subject, whatever is the subject. Do you agree? Well, my question is, is that how can he talk about what the dialectic is without using the divided line? Without using it. the example of the divided line as Socrates does in the Republic. Well, that is a rather curious thing. You know, I mean, he describes it, there are the dialectic. No, there are no, yes, there are no examples. Yeah. He uh, doesn't take you through it. No. No. But we could ask this question, sir. As you examine the claims, see, does it exhaust the subject? Well, that's why you have to have here a sufficient picture of what the dialectic is, so you can just check them off and see what's left. Or you can then see whether he's adding something that's not on your list. Now, I asked you last week if you could take the time uh, to look over the section of dialectic in Book 6 and Book 7 in Plato's Republic. The section on dialectic. Both Book 6, Book 7. And by the way, we're working on the assumption that our friend Elmer O'Brien is a competent enough translator that he's, he's uh, there's a certain integrity to the text, where the, therefore the key terms follow from the Greek, and let's leave that behind for a while. Right. So, in the dialectic, therefore, we have book six in the Republic and book seven. Now, would you not agree we need a volunteer? And wouldn't you agree I, I can pretty much pick out a volunteer, can I not? Better than most. Huh? Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, Brad. What am I getting volunteered for? <laughs> Consider what Plato says in the sixth book about dialectic. Mm -hmm. right. And by the way, isn't it fair that I call upon you? Yes. Louder? Yes. Good. Why? Because I wrote a paper about this, but I forgot. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you fortunate or unfortunate enough to pass it my way? I was, but I have, uh, it's baffled me how my paper has slipped from my mind. Come on. Many times. Seriously. But yeah, I did. Okay, look, there are two goals in Platonic, the whole Platonic world. The good and the idea of the good. The idea of the good, as we all know, is often called the brilliant light of being. Right? So, the good, or the, the one, and capital I, idea of the good. 
And this is called in the Republic the most brilliant light of being. And it also takes on the name <coughs> of the intelligible. So book six deals with this. Book seven is the dialectic leading to the good itself. So, <clears throat> now there are other sections in Plato dealing with the dialectic other than clearly in the Republic. Uh, Parmenides, Phaedrus, a whole bunch, several. Especially the Phaedrus has some good, good comments, uh, Philebus. So in any case, let's just take those for a moment. <clears throat> Back in the first paragraph of section five, is there anything in that paragraph that we might be able to use to make our study? Therefore, since dialectic is our most valuable mental discipline, it must be directed to being. Mm -hmm. This is the being. Mm -hmm. right. And to the existence that is of most value. Existence, that's in the realm of being. at least. And he's going to explain that, which is to say, as wisdom, it is concerned with being and intelligence. With being and intelligence. As wisdom it is concerned with being, and as intelligence, it's concerned with what is beyond being. What's beyond being is seven. So tell me, as you look at that, how does he link up intelligence with that which is beyond being? Because intelligence is the, the sixth, the book six, the dialectic leading to being. Ends with idea. Idea leads with idea. What is his approach then? It's through intelligence that you get to that which is beyond intelligence and beyond being. Is that correct? Yeah. As you take a look at it, come on, just take a look. Is that what it's saying? 
then he's co collapsing two different kinds of dialectic into one. Right? What Socrates separated, considers it different. And yet he makes the case for the fact that philosophy must be concerned with same and difference. Great problem, isn't it? Yeah. But Pierre, isn't he kind of missing the point of of the analogy that the Republic makes about the fact that the sun provides, you know, all those things for sight, but it is not, you know, in and of itself that which it creates. Well, then he doesn't give us enough. Well, but that's what I'm saying. The sun being the good and, you know, the idea of the good, the, you know, luminousness and so forth, he, he's, you know, missing the point about the good, you know, having well, if a separate we want, existence. If we want to be generous, see, we're trying to be okay. generous. Okay. It looks like you're saying it's through intelligence, being, that one reaches what is beyond being. Now that's just one phrase, isn't it? Yeah. And you're saying it needs more. Yeah. Needs more, perhaps. Right. There's no connection to the good, yeah. Yeah. except his assertion that intelligence yeah. Yeah. is a direction, and that's not what Socrates, Plato says. Mm. Look, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Look, try again. I'm not. I'm staying on this issue for a moment. Okay. Same indifference. It's going to be the same problem. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, sir, um, when was the last time you were a volunteer? Uh, I think the last time you called on me. Then you have plenty, plenty of experience. Especially when good, good. Tell me, how many things have you uh, experienced in this uh, room that are uh, different? Um, uh, tons. Plenty. Uh, plethora. You mean you look around here, you see a lot of differences? Indeed. Huh? I have lots of experience with differences. Uh, where do you see same? <coughs> uh, all over the place. Where? Point it out for us. Uh, I don't know about same, but similar. No, 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 no similar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do you, you see same? Um, Remember Harry Drogodovich? Yeah, McGee. McGee, remember him? Yeah. Yeah. He used to go around to people and say, hey, how many changes have you gone through? Yeah, he used to. Well, is there, <laughs> well have you changed? Or is there something about you that stays the same? Both. Uh, you'd say what? Both. Louder? Both. Both? Mm -hmm. Well, talk about that which is the same since she has experience of both. Go ahead. I'll take the difference. <laughs> no, 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 no. You need practice. Um, I could be getting, I do that myself. The soul? Um, no. Let me see. The soul? No, I'm trying. Soul? It's the same soul? Soul. Do you need help? Yes, I do. Hey, go either to the left or the right. <laughs> I can't say that I have experienced like this. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. We got plenty of this, agree? Oh yeah. Now the key word here is what does it do in the dialectic? It knows both. Right? And we're trying to get, Miss, excuse me, would you please tell us what you know about the, the same that we just mentioned a moment ago? And how did you discover it? I've just always known it. Oh, well, might as well take whatever you can get. Yeah. What about, excuse me, what about geometry? Geometry four. figures? On four. Um, two circles? <laughs> Well, Say more about it. Um, for example, 
two geometric objects, two equilateral triangles, same size, would that qualify as the same or similar? Let us assume for the moment that there are, in fact, things that we can say are the same in geometry. All right. Now, what would it mean to know same? You would have, you would, it presupposes something to reference each example, something to compare them against, like a model. You'd have to say it's the same as something else. Yeah. Oh, is that the same thing for difference? Yes. Both require... Well, then you know both in the same way. Yeah. Can I help out, please? Well, I, I... I see different human... I mean, different people here, and yet I'm able to see that there is an idea of a human being in all of them, the same human being. For instance, I see Susan and me as different, and yet I'm able to say she's a human being, I'm a human being. Therefore, the idea of a human being is the same. Good. Now we want to know, what does it mean to make the claim that you know that? You've identified the situation where you can use the word same, <laughs> Now, he's saying, the dialectic, you come to know both. Did you say that's sufficient? Well, in two, For knowing? In, in, two ge in two geometric figures that are, the, that are the same, they're generated in the same way. The same way you generate a circle is the same way you generate a circle. Let us assume now, we, in the realm of geometry, we can point out things that we can say are the same. How do you discover and how do you recognize the fact that you came to know? Now we want to use the word know. Dialectic leads you to know both of these. Is that, that's his claim, is it not? Come on. Stay in the text, yes or no? Mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> it knows identity and difference. I'm taking same as identity at this moment, okay? Ah! Curious word. By the way, you ever deal with this problem of two things, or if there's an identity between two things, there's only one thing there? Sounds platonic to me. Is, yeah. is that right or wrong? Yes. Right. Two plus two and four are the same. We always go to these very complex problems. <laughs> well, I like to keep it simple. Well, you didn't. It's a very strange problem. Huh? Maybe Here. we have some fun to going into it. But uh, now, just take take your example. How does that show identity and difference? <laughs> well, I have to use more letters to say two plus two. But, as far as the study of number is concerned, they're identical. See, the, the two issues, okay? We first want to establish there is a way in which we can use the word identity or same to given objects. Then we want to know, how can you be brought to make the claim that you know it? The two. If we get that, we can go to the third. And how is that knowing function of a dialectical exploration. There we got three, so. so let us grant for the moment
that we, you have given us several objects that deserve the title identity. All right? Okay. How can you be, how can you come to make the claim that you know identity? Yeah, I wouldn't concern those objects. You'd be cautious about that. Yeah, those objects. But that's, look who you're sitting next to, both on the left and the right, you can call on for help. Yeah. Okay, back row. <laughs> We know identity. Well, I was thinking um, with your previous question, if there's something common between the two things, is there just one thing? Right? Um, for instance, if you have two things that are red. Oh, what well, would you say if, if there are two things you're claiming are identical, then you can't find any difference between them? Right. And if you can't find any difference between them, you only have one, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, then all you have to do is discover how everything is one, and that's the problem of identity. Was that right? <laughs> yeah. so, would you describe the part of your, the, your experience of continuously being being aware continuously of being the same, Brad? And I'll write it out on the board. Can you say that again, please? Yeah, I can. <laughs> you just asked me if I could. Really? Right. By the way, are you the same Brad that was here last week? Yes. Oh, good, good. I guess you can point to something that you're saying is the same. Sure. Oh. Has that been around for a while or just recently? A while. Oh, then you have plenty of experience of it. And certainly if someone has a lot of experience of something, they should be in a good position, should they not, Susan, being able to describe it? Absolutely. Yeah, see, she's on your side. Okay, describe it. By the way, if it is the if it is identical, you're only talking about one thing. Yeah, it's just one. <coughs> or do you want to say it's a thing? Right. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Would you agree everything else is other? I see clearly how this is a problem of same and different. Oh. <laughs> We're same and other. And what do you see about this curious problem of same and difference, or identical and difference? That it should be found out. What did you say? <laughs> that it should be found out. Well, ask him a question. Um, Go ahead. Ask him. <laughs> She heard you better than I. Go ahead, so I ask him a question. How should we find this out? How do we? Well, Thank you. How do you, how do you, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? How do you explain that on one level everything's one and yet there's differences? How can you turn around and ask a question when he's supposed to be the volunteer who's giving answers? Well, you have this, you have this, uh, you have this uh, identity that you're supposed to uh, talk about, right? Yes, yes, yes. I'm yes. supposed to talk about. Yes. Yet, uh, there is, I'm surrounded by difference and other. Yeah, well, put that aside. <laughs> Well, I would say that the, I would describe the identity as uh, uh, Are you now going through a process of trying to talk about how you can say that you know identity? Yes. Ah, and what are you going through in your struggle? Were proper names, or a proper name. And if you gave it a proper name, 
right? You would be describing it, is that right? Oh, would that mark it as different from everything else? Yes. Well, then you'd be giving me a difference in the name. That's the problem. Don't do that. Different. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. What do you find interesting about it? We're going through a dialectic right now, exploring identity and difference, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And if we can use words in this way, it's causing you some... Go ahead. Heavy reflection. Reflection? Uh, yeah, reflection. This is, this is what he calls dialectic. Now, in terms of Plato, right? Uh, we can change the word slightly because different is the same as other, mm -hmm. right? He says the soul, the soul is made up of just two things, same and other. And they're mixed, they're mixed. Mm -hmm. And then with being, they're then doled out and that generates soul in the universe, and in the various ways in which the planets can be said to exist in the cosmos. And ultimately, therefore, the whole Greek diatonic scale and the orders in the heavens. Same and other. Same thing. Same and other. Same and identity. And difference. We're trying to explore now how you can be said to come to know the two. That's where we're going. Jump in. Okay. Okay. Can, we, can it be you know, said that the same has the effect that is the same on all others in terms of the relationship to itself, as we talked about earlier from Proclus' example? Uh, no, he's concerned with how to know it. Look here. He's concerned. I know what to do. Ah, I forgot. Oh. So, uh, I practice this at home tonight. So, watch. Okay. Uh, I grasp the chalk. You saw that? Could you not say you're witnessing someone grasp an object through the senses? <coughs> Sense of touch? Right? So through the sense of touch, I can grasp objects, right? Immediately. Agree? I mean, I don't have to stop and figure it out, do I? Is that right? Yeah. That's how you come to know this. Would you read it for us? Watch. Um, dialectic accordingly has no knowledge of propositions as such, they are to it as letters are to words. But it knows the propositions and knowing the truth. In general, it knows the operations of the soul, affirmation and denial, whether denial is of affirmation or of something else. It knows identity and difference. These it grasps, go ahead. These it grasps immediately as sensation grasps objects. Right. How does it do it? Immediately. Therefore, what do you have to do? You have to grasp what we were talking about as identity. How? Bang! Right? Go ahead. I like the last sentence. The task of treating them in detail it leads to those who have a taste for it. Therefore, we can <laughs> go into section six. Is that not true? But how do you have to grasp this, knowing identity and difference? Intuitively? Yeah. Immediately. The way immediately, the way sensation grasps its objects. Without hesitation. Right. Spontaneous. Without mediation. No mediation, that's right. Now this next paragraph is really curious. Dialectic, therefore, is the most valuable. But philosophy has other parts. It studies nature using dialectic as other sciences use arithmetic. But drawing 
a much greater benefit from dialectic because they're so closely allied. Again, added by dialectic, philosophy treats of one, conduct, two, the study of habits, three, exercises productive of good habits. The rational habits derive their characteristics from dialectic and preserve much of it even in their uh, interaction with material things. Therefore, come on. Aided by dialectic, what does philosophy treat of? Three classes of things, right? <clears throat> Conduct, habits, exercise and production of good habits, right? See, it's not this. It's not this. So he's saying the dialectic treats of virtues. Essentially. Agree? Right? Virtues are those moral excellences, or the word virtue is a bad word, but courage. Right? Wisdom. Right? Good old. What's the other one? Prudence. What one? Was it a prudence? What? Prudence. No, I don't like that word. Sophosunity. Temperance? What? Temperance. Cool headedness. What did you say? Cool headedness. Cool. Sophosunity. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's that curious word that no one uses anymore temperance. And that's where I, our colleague used the word keeping her cool, which comes close to what this word means. Right. So dialectic treats of these. And in that respect, these are the objects in the Republic. And Plato does explore them dialectically, therefore he's quite correct in that. <laughs> sure. The If other virtues imply as well the application of reason to their respective experiences and actions, prudence, being concerned with the universal, applies reason in a still higher fashion. And consider whether actions are consistent, whether an action should be engaged in now or deferred, or whether there is a better action to take its place. That's called what? Prudence. Yeah, I don't really got a better word for prudence. It's phronesis, which you might expect, right? What is it, Barbara? Phronesis. Fro what? Phronesis, which some is in some contexts is wisdom. So that's a range you might want to look at. Ah. Could you say more, a little bit more about this curious word? Just <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, you know, the passage we were just working on said that, um, it said that uh, dialectic is, where is my quote? It gave a distinction between phronesis, and, as phronesis it is concerned with being, as mind it is concerned with what is beyond being. Mm -hmm. It was one of the descriptors of dialectic. Yes. So it looked like phronesis is concerned with up to the realm of the idea of good, and then it is saying noose uh -huh. is what is goes beyond, uh -huh. which is helps a little bit, I think. 
Okay. But it's hard because phronesis is almost everywhere here. Wisdom. So, I know. That's prudence. good to know. Go ahead. I know prudence. I know prudence. Good. Go ahead. It's a, a good, contraction good. of the Latin for see, uh, beyond and seeing, providence. You use more providence. Good. It's a contraction of the word providence, uh -huh. or seeing beyond. Really? That's charming. Yes, very nice. I have no idea. That's very nice. No. Do it again. It's a contraction over time of the two words pro, which means beyond, and videns which means seen, as in providence. Yeah. It's a contraction of the word providence, or seen beyond. I didn't know that. That's good. Okay, look here, let me try something, okay? This idea is not in the Gita. Right? Arjuna. I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of Arjuna. Right? I know. You should, you should. That's the great Bhagavad Gita where the great warrior has to face the morning of battle and the battle is between, uh, it's, it's a civil war, it splits families, friends, teachers and he has to go to war and he doesn't want to go to war. He thinks maybe it would be better to be a sannyasin and his charioteer happens to be Krishna, the Lord, and they engage in a dialogue. And Krishna is trying to persuade Arjuna to stay and fight. And Arjuna is saying, why should I fight? Isn't there a better alternative? All of these questions, therefore, could go to Arjuna so under the term prudence. So take a look. Arjuna is asking whether actions are consistent, whether it should be engaged in now or deferred or whether there's a better action to take its place. That's his position. That's Arjuna's position entirely. The only trouble is it's solved by Krishna. He says, oh, all society would fall if you don't carry out your duties of your caste. You are a warrior, and if you don't take on the task of a warrior, the whole caste system will crumble. So, okay. I'll oh my go. God. Sorry. Therefore, okay, I'll go to it sounds like the whole path pathologos. I think oh. so too, but I want yeah. to say that out loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, right in there is Krishna's dilemma. And it's solved, of course, not Krishna, Arjuna's dilemma. And it's set apart by making the judgment, you do this now. And he does take hmm. it on and goes into battle. Well, so this particular kind of reflection is not a part of that system. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't get that the distinction you're just making. That's why he therefore can come to that big sentence in the, next, in the middle of the next paragraph. The virtues must either precede or accompany the progress made in dialectic. Natural virtues one possesses with the assistance of wisdom, ah, becoming perfect virtues. Wisdom comes after the natural virtues to perfect the habitual. Natural virtues either grow and are perfected along with wisdom, or wisdom uh, enters in at one point and perfects them. Therefore, would you not agree? The virtues exist with wisdom. If you put all of that together, does it not? Take a look. Is that legitimate? Take a look, please. Let me know. Hmm. String those things together. Sorry, what was your conclusion, Pierre, that you were saying followed from that? Well, if we reason tightly with those words, then we can say that his conclusion, that virtue 
virtues must either precede or accompany the progress made in dialectic in its acquisition of wisdom. Hmm. Should it not? Stay in the paragraph, yeah. please. Yes, yes, wisdom comes after the natural virtues to protect, well, sequentially it looks like they're related. No, you know? no. David? It's sounding like, to him, dialectic's more like a yoga. It, it, it involves no. practice and action and fruition of action. Whereas in Plato it's more in terms of the logo. No, and that's not here. Yeah. No. No. And, um, Doesn't he weasel out of the conclusion, or are those two alternatives? The natural virtues either grow and are perfected along with wisdom, that's right. or wisdom enters in at one point and perfects them. Are those two alternatives? Or I is he know, just failing to conclude? And or, or either or. Now, uh, in this section, therefore, we have a real fine grasp of the center, centerpiece of wisdom. Our perfection we owe primarily to both natural virtue and wisdom. Hmm. And natural virtues that one possesses with the assistance of wisdom become perfect. So, even if you have natural virtues, they become perfect with the acquisition of wisdom. And the point that you, David, made. Uh, it would be nice if he explored this idea of wisdom because he needs to have it connected with logos mm -hmm. right? or reason in a higher sense, not merely logical, discursive reason. But he doesn't. And that's his difference from Plato. The other part is um, <clears throat> what is this issue? This issue is over desires. Is it none? Any one of these? Mm -hmm. And for Plato, there are two kinds of desires, the wanted and the unwanted, necessary and unnecessary. And for Plato, the unnecessary desires, which cause everybody problems, in the most curious part of Plato's Republic, the only way you can deal with unnecessary desires is not by stomping your feet on the ground and saying no, 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 but the study of dreams. It's only through the study of dreams. that you can then find any way to grasp the problem of unnecessary desires, which is Book Nine in Plato's Republic. Agree? Two things are necessary for the study of dreams, nomos and logos, <coughs> law and reason. With those two, you approach the study of dreams and you have a ball. And that's missing entirely in the timeless. As well as the problem with courage, as we mentioned last week. Or as Mark did. Is he here for that? Yeah, get him to talk about it again. Sort of. There he is. Mark, we need you to make a couple of penetrating points about Plato's idea of courage. Oh, 
Vibrant <laughs> encouragement. Vibrant encouragement. Yeah, encouragement. Onwards. Onwards. What we were discussing last week mm -hmm. is um, through um, fear and desire, pleasure and pain, holding on to the belief that um, reality is good in itself. Okay, well, let me give everybody a problem. Okay. There is no way to get into Plato unless you understand the problem of courage. That means you have to go to the section in Book 4 of Plato's Republic. It's only a page and a half. And you have to nail down what he means by courage. Now, in this section, there's a great statement about all of the ideas. You can list them that are connected with this idea of courage. Then you have to see that in the following paragraph, he gives a very beautiful analogy to it. The analogy is how you have to prepare garments for dyeing, how you have to purify and keeping it pure, the color will not take. Right? Then he goes further then and completes this curious study. And by doing that, he goes back and he highlights some of these ideas. You will find, however, that the key one is that you have to you have to be able to grasp what is reality in itself no no what is in order to i'm sorry i don't follow the question mm -hmm. What's that word saying? What does it say? You have to have a belief. Mm -hmm. It has to be the object of your education. Mm -hmm. oh, about what the law givers determine is dangerous? What is to be feared, feared and what is not. Another word for feared. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, feared. Mm -hmm. Well, and you have to hold this hated. belief through both pleasure and pain. And desire and fear. fear and, desire. Pardon? and desire and fear. Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. And one should do this, it'll be inadequate. <laughs> oh, right, because you don't know. You have to... You mean you have to get that what piece. is to be most exactly. feared, and what is and what is not. Yes. And therefore, as you do with Plato, you go back and you find out where it is and where he discusses it, which is in Book Two, the end of Book Two. Mm -hmm. Now you have to do that to see. Because he's going to make a statement, he's going to say, you know, the worst thing which both men and gods hate is to have a wrong idea to about be the nature of reality. About what is real. Yes, to be deceived about what is good and what is not. Right? And have it in both the leading gods party. And men hate that above all other things. Oh, I just said it. And, and to have it in the ruling part of the soul. And have it about in the ruling what part of the soul. Rules your soul, about how you rule. Yeah, you'll be in a mess. That's the path of Logos, isn't it? Yeah. The true lie. Pardon? He said, uh, Stillman said, that's the path of Logos. That is what the path of Logos is. Oh, yeah. False. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's quite true. So therefore, he comes up with this magnificent statement that you have to be able, through any 
pleasure and pain. Not the avoidance and running away from one and running to the other. That's not his game. In the middle of it, you have to hold on to the idea that God is good, good. in reality. If you can hold on to that idea in the middle of pleasure and pain, that's courage. Now that's a cultivation. That's what he calls courage. And therefore, isn't it a great thing now that we can leave dialectic behind? Since that's the end of book six. I'm at chapter six. So what other part do you want to do of our good friend Plotinus? We didn't do anything about the soul, did we? Oh, wait a minute. We did the three primal hypostases? Did we do soul? We were going to do the descent of the soul. Sir, descent of the soul? We talked about that last week. We, we will. Okay. Let's do it. Descent of the soul it is. Next time, which is page 62. The opening paragraph is great, isn't it? It has happened often. Roused into myself from my body, outside everything else, and inside myself, my gaze has met a beauty wondrous and great. Such moments, I've been certain that mine was the better part, mine the best of lives, lived to the fullest, mine identity with the divine fixed there, poised above everything in the intellectual that is less than the highest, utter actuality was mine. But then there has come the descent down from intellection to the discourse of reason, and it leaves me puzzled. Why this descent? That's where we're going. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, there's one other interesting quote, which is... Just last one, just... The language he uses here is... Um, <clears throat> what is most dangerous... And what is not? Dangerous, see? Dangerous. Or fear, same thing. You know. Or... Oh, I was just going to say that, um, you know, we were talking about phronesis. Yes, versus phronesis. Versus news. Yes. Right? And I just wanted to say, it's interesting that he makes the quote, dialectic is the purest part of news and phronesis. So it looks like uh, dialectic is that which can moves through both. Can I say that? Or it is common to both? Isn't that odd? Because it seems like he distinguishes nous from phronesis, but then he says dialectic is the purest part, and he calls it he calls it a habit mm -hmm. or habituation, or the, the term can also mean that which results from having a habit, a conditioning of the soul. But it's interesting that then the dialectic is going to be used to distinguish among habits, the, those that are good and those that are not, right? Mm. So I was baffled a little bit by that. Uh, because it sounds like it's um, uh, you're using one thing to distinguish the same thing, y as if it were circular in some way. So I'm kind of a little bit confused about that. Or one could even say a lot confused about that. <laughs> but what I, what I thought was interesting was the dialectic functions in both, in, in, in phronesis and in nous. If, uh, you know, the other curiosity, of course, is that Phronesis. Huh. Always a lot of curiosity. The mind doing the ascent. Right.
that uses a special kind of function of the mind, which he calls renaissance. Hmm. But in order to use the mind in a special way, you need the exercise of the intellect. Hmm. So. Hmm. Would you say, <clears throat> I mean, you did say we were going to see quite clearly how, you did say we were going to see quite clearly how Plotinus is not a Platonist with respect. Well, in this respect to this, uh, central to Plato is the idea of how to deal with desire. Hmm. Once one way he deals with it is under the idea of courage. Mm -hmm. The other way of dealing with desires and unnecessary desires is through the application of reason and law in the study of dreams. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't touch on either of these two, and oh. therefore that is a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and this keeps it more in the in the uh, realm of the mind. See, Plotinus' dialectic is, is... See, the trouble with Plotinus is not Plotinus, as Porphyry wrote all the notes from his talks, and most of the talks that he said were actually dialogues, but we don't have any. Porphyry, a philosopher at the time, took notes. And what we have is the notes that he made during these talks. So, unfortunately, they're very compact. And we don't know how good of a note taker he was. <laughs> that's true, though. There's yes. Or what do you see? I, it just oh, seems no, no, to no. me. No, no, no. That's good. Right. All we'd have to see is the difference between Porphyry and Plato to see to what degree that same difference is between Plotinus mm. and Plato. We could attribute it perhaps as a bridge to Porphyry. Mm. And for Porphyry, the points we just made are not present either. Mm. What was the point you were making about Arjuna? Pardon? What was the point you were making about the Gita, that the Gita does not do what? Because you, you went through a regular... Plotinus does not use the idea of courage the way Plato does on no, the Republic. No, I'm going back before, before that. Go. What does the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, not do? Well, I think I pointed it out in the charts that uh, he does not deal with all of those issues that we identify, and therefore it's a missing part of the Gita. Since Krishna comes and gives him the answers, they don't solve whether or not it's better for him to be in the battle or not. He just says, hey, the whole society might collapse. Oh, right. And he said, well, wait a minute, maybe I should be a sannyasin and go into, into, into the forest and be a meditator, a contemplator. He says, no, 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 don't do that. It's good. Don't do that. The whole society, the structure of our society would fall. Yeah. Of course, I... That's in terms of Hinduism, I'm a sudra, I'm an untouchable, I wouldn't care if the society collapsed. <laughs> Why would you be an untouchable? Pardon? Why would you be an untouchable or not? Because I'm not a Brahmin. <laughs> and I'm not defending Brahmins, therefore I'm not a Kshatriya. I'm not a merchant, and therefore the only other class of left over <laughs> is the untouchable. No. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. He's some kind of warrior. Okay, is that it? But uh, uh, in section six, though, the second paragraph, his idea of prudence is not present in the data if we take prudence to mean these things that are listed here in sequence. Right? Five? Okay, good. Up here? Oh, any announcements? How does Plotinus deal with desire? My question to you. How does Plotinus deal with desire? How does Plotinus deal with desire? Yes, he has about uh, 
Could be. But, you know, it looks, doesn't look like the logo is that much help. That's that helpful. No. Yeah. Yeah. But you're looking at the great thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting words. But it still doesn't deal with the first one. Oh, and then, yeah. Oh, with respect to that, I agree. It doesn't look like the Brian. Okay. Those. Yeah, he, what he makes us